We're now going to revisit pretty much everything we know about mechanics. So kinematics, force, energy, and momentum. But now we're going to look at it in an angular sense or a rotational sense. We'll start out by looking at a rotating sphere. Now we could describe this with linear quantities. We could talk about the velocity of every point on the surface or even all the points on the interior. But they're going to have different velocities and there's going to be a whole bunch of them and that would be a big mess for something that looks like a pretty simple motion that's going on here. Now if we use angular quantities, we would notice that the whole thing is rotating at the same rate. Any point on the interior, exterior, near the equator or the poles, they're always going to have the same angular quantities. So if we can come up with a system for describing this motion in terms of angular quantities, then our life will be a lot easier. Now we're looking at the same basic quantities with the same relationships. We just use different symbols. So instead of having x for position, we're going to use a theta for angular position. And then our change in position is still called the displacement. Our change in displacement over time is still considered a velocity. And our change in velocity over time is still an acceleration. Now we've got different symbols. This is a Greek letter omega. It looks a whole lot like a w, but it is an omega. This is a Greek letter alpha. It looks a fair amount like an a, but it, you know it's a little more curvy and whatnot. So if we think about what these quantities are describing, if we call the x-axis a uh, displacement of zero, and you can have any location be, not displacement of zero, a position of zero, you can have any location be position zero, just like you could in the linear sense. Then you can have some location along this line here that is theta one, so everything that lies along that line has the same angular position of theta one. And then if the wheel rotates a bit, such that this line here is now oriented over here, it's now at a different location, now theta two. And you would have a change in location, a displacement of delta theta, which is gonna be given by that angle there. Okay, and then if we knew the time it took to go from there to there, we could divide that delta theta by a time and find the rotational or the angular velocity. And then maybe it goes to some other position over here where we have some big long theta three. And if we knew the difference in the velocity going from uh, one to two and then from two to three, maybe we have some acceleration going on. So we would um, divide the change in angular velocity by the time. Now these are only gonna give us average quantities, uh, just like we saw with the linear case. If you only know the endpoints, you know, the location here and here and here and not exactly what happened in between you can only find the average quantities here but we can find the instantaneous quantities by using our kinematic equations so just like our wonderful linear kinematic equations I'm sure you've missed these guys we can have the exact same equations in the same form substituting in our theta omegas and alphas and all of these relationships still hold we can also go back and forth between the angular and the linear quantities. As I mentioned earlier with that rotating sphere, every point on that sphere does have a given velocity. And all we have to do is multiply the angular quantities here by the radius, where r is defined as the distance between the axis of rotation, often that is the center of the object, but it doesn't have to be. It's the distance between the axis of rotation and the point that you're concerned about. So even though all, if we imagine this disc here rotating, even though all of the points on the disc are gonna have the same rotational velocity because they're gonna have the same change in angle over time, they will have different distances traveled because this guy is gonna travel in a larger circle. That's a terrible circle, but you get the idea. Uh, larger circle than some point close by here. So that's gonna be a smaller circle. So this L here is gonna give us the distance traveled. Uh, it is a distance, not a displacement. Also, this guy is going to be moving faster here than this guy. So again, that difference in R is going to make V different depending on how far you are from that axis of rotation, even if omega is the same. Now here we have tangential acceleration. And what happens here is if this disk is speeding up or slowing down, then we have tangential acceleration. We call it tangential because it's always going to be tangent to the circle. Now, if it's rotating counterclockwise and speeding up, then alpha is going to be in this direction, tangent to the circle. 
but it doesn't have to be in the same direction as rotation just like we saw with linear acceleration you can be moving forward and slowing down and your acceleration would be backwards so this could be rotating counterclockwise and slowing down in that case the acceleration would be in the opposite direction. Now it gets a little tricky because we've seen things moving in a circle. Now we're not so concerned about circular motion because we're, we're more concerned about the motion of the entire object, but you can describe a point on the object as moving in a circle. And we saw previously that whenever you're moving in a circle you have a certain type of acceleration, but it is not this tangential acceleration. You can go in a circle and if alpha is zero then your tangential acceleration can be zero. That other type of acceleration, we call it centripetal acceleration most of the time. Here they call it uh, radial acceleration on the diagram, so I used an R here as well, but often we wrote it with a C there. And this was our equation, V squared over R, if you remember that, and it was always toward the center of the circle. So whenever you're going in a circle, you may or may not have tangential, so that it depends on the situation but you always have radial acceleration. And we can relate this radial acceleration to the same angular quantities by substituting in r omega for v, and since that's quantity squared, one of the r's cancels out and you get omega squared r. So that's one way to find your radial acceleration. So just to give you a little visual example here, here we have a disk rotating at a constant rate. So omega is constant. Now your velocity is going to depend on how far you are from the middle because your velocity is r times omega and they have different r's. Your accelerations, your centripetal accelerations are also going to be different depending on your distance from the center because your v's are different and it's v squared over r and your r is different as well. In this case you've got a constant rotation rate so you don't have any alpha, you don't have any angular acceleration. Now let's jump back to this picture for a minute and assume that omega is growing. It is no longer constant. In that case, if it's growing, we're going to get a angular acceleration in the direction of rotation since it's increasing, which tells us that our tangential acceleration is not zero. So we will have a tangential acceleration in addition to our angular acceleration. Now over time, our tangential acceleration could be constant if we're speeding up at a constant rate. But as our velocity gets bigger, that means that this one is going to grow with time. So there's all kinds of things going on here. If we wanted to find the total acceleration at a given moment, since this guy's changing, we would just add these two vectors together. So add that guy over there, and your total acceleration is going to be something off in this direction here. If we wanted to actually find that value, we would do vector addition, the total acceleration is the sum of the tangential plus the radial or centripetal acceleration here. Now don't just add these two numbers together, these are vectors so you have to add them like sides of a triangle. If you wanted to find the magnitude for instance of the total acceleration it would be the square root of the magnitudes of both of the other accelerations. Now the last thing we're going to look at is rolling motion and how to analyze that from different perspectives. So to start with, let's imagine somebody riding by on a bicycle and somebody standing on the sidewalk, stationary relative to the sidewalk, watching that bike go by. From their perspective, the middle of the tire is moving to the right with some velocity v, and that velocity is equal to the velocity of the bicycle because the middle of the wheel here is not moving at a different speed than the entire bicycle. So you've got some velocity v. From that perspective, this point on the ground here is actually fixed, which is a little weird to think about, but because the tire is not sliding at any given moment in time, the bottom there is motionless as the middle goes to the right. Now we can think about a different perspective, which is that of the person riding the bike. From their perspective, the bike tire is not going to the right. It's just sitting right below their nose the whole time. So from their perspective, the center of that tire is motionless, and the bottom of the tire is actually moving to the left. The top of the tire would then be moving to the right. And we can use some pretty simple logic to figure out what these speeds are here, which is going to be a useful tool. If we think about the observer on the sidewalk who said that the middle of the tire was going to the right with some velocity v equal to the speed of the bike from their perspective, and that the bottom of the tire is zero, well, that gives us a relative velocity between these two points uh, of relative velocity of v because here v is zero. 
Now, all observers from any perspectives, as long as they're inertial perspectives, they're going to agree on the relative velocities of two points. For example, if you have a police officer running down a pickpocket, whether you're moving in a car or walking on the sidewalk or standing still, you're going to measure their velocities differently, but their relative velocities, basically how fast the police officer is gaining on the pickpocket, hopefully if they catch them, uh, those relative velocities are always going to be the same for all observers. So what that tells us is the relative velocity between these two points has got to be the same as between these two points. And here we said the center had a velocity of zero, which means this velocity here is also v, or you could call it negative v, I guess, since it's going in the other direction. Now, we can also think about from this perspective, the wheel is just turning, and the bottom of the wheel is going to the left at the same speed that the top of the wheel is going to the right. Because just imagine a wheel sitting there spinning at a constant rate, obviously this end is going to be turning at the same speed as that end. Well that tells us the difference between these two is V, and that also tells us that the top of this wheel here is going to be going at twice the speed of the bike. So this is just kind of a useful little tool because often we will know how fast the bike is going and then we might need to figure out the uh, centripetal acceleration on the edge and this is going to allow us to relate the speed of the bike to the rotation rate of the uh, outer edge of the bike. From this perspective here you want to think about it as rotating about point P so it's like this whole tire is going to be rotating down around like this and that's why that ends up going twice as fast as the middle whereas here you think about it as rotation about point C. Okay that's all see you next time.